Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and particularly for honoring me with a degree from Emerson College. President Liebergott, distinguished platform members, families and friends of the graduates, and most importantly, the graduating class, congratulations. Thank you for inviting me to share this special day with you. Today, you shed an identity that you've had for at least the past two years, and that's one of being a graduate school student. You know you are a graduate student when you have difficulty reading anything that doesn't contain footnotes. The concept of free time scares you. The professor doesn't show up in your class, and you discuss the readings anyway. <laughs> you rate coffee shops by the availability of outlets for your laptop. And finally, you find yourself explaining to children that you are in the 20th grade. <laughs> But I want to begin my remarks by congratulating you for two decisions that you've really already made. I believe both of these will serve you very well in the future. Your first was deciding to come to Emerson and earn an advanced degree. I talked to a lot of undergraduates at the University of Georgia who are trying to decide what to do next. I always advise them that a master's degree is well worth the investment in time and money. Today, many hiring managers in the communications field only consider people with master's degrees, even for entry-level positions. And if a graduate degree isn't essential when you're hired, it'll most likely be essential in order to be promoted. And if one of your motivations was waiting out a dismal job market, that seems to be turning out well for you, too. I just read that this year's job market is considerably better than it has been for the past two years. In 2009, hiring of new graduates dropped by 22 percent. But a new survey indicates that hiring has now increased by about 5 percent. That's at least a step in the right direction. Every day on my way to work, I pass a billboard. It says, recession, it's a test, not a final. That's encouraging, but of course, something much more important has happened to you as a graduate student. You had the opportunity to delve deeply into a type of communication or the arts that really matters to you. Which brings me to the second important decision you've already made. You've chosen communication, some form of communication, as your profession. I can't think of any other discipline that offers so many divergent career paths, yet speaks to such a fundamental characteristic of being human, and that's our interaction with one another. One reason I approve so wholeheartedly of your decisions to pursue a graduate degree and to study communication is that they are the same life-changing decisions I made on a much earlier timetable. I'm going to guess that when you began your education, you were not all committed to becoming a communication professional. Instead, I suspect that something happened along the way to put you on this path. Let me tell you a story of how that happened for me. I came from a family where no one had ever attended college. My father didn't even graduate from high school. We had no books, we had no works of art, and no music in the house. We lived in a small town, and we did do lots of hunting and fishing. I decided to go to college mainly because my teachers and my friends encouraged me. My horizons were pretty limited. If you went to college in 1962 and you were female, the only option seemed to be to be a teacher or a nurse. I decided very confidently that I was going to be a kindergarten teacher. Then I took a required public speaking course. The professor was a woman, Janet Norberg. She was my first female professor and one of only a few I encountered during college and graduate school. 
The simple fact of having her there at the front of a college classroom created a possibility for me that I had not even considered before. She encouraged me to join the debate team and partic participate in speaking contests. Before long, I changed my major to communication and began applying to graduate schools. Professor Norberg introduced me to my life's work in a field I love and find challenging even now. Your experiences as communication professionals, though, will be very different from mine. In 1967, I sat where you are today. I received an MA degree in communication from the University of Iowa. In 1967, we had no personal computers, no email, no cell phones, no Facebook, and no Twitter. I went on to earn a PhD in communication, which took five more years, and even then, I wrote my dissertation on a typewriter and had to produce perfect pages with no typos. Analyzing data for my dissertation involved key punching, stacks of paper cards, and taking them to the computer center, where mainframe machines with less computational power than your laptop slowly churned out results. We felt lucky if we got a 24-hour turnaround. Today, any one of you could do the same analysis in seconds. A series of technological advances have repeatedly remade the communication environment during my 40-year career, from cable TV to smartphones and iPads. Chances are that you will see even more amazing changes during your working lives. In fact, probably none of us today can foresee how we will be communicating 40 years from now. But I promise you this, we will be communicating. How we do it might change, but our essential human need for connection does not. This past semester, a communication professor at the University of Maryland asked her students to try an experiment. She called it 24 hours unplugged. For 24 hours, the students were asked to completely shut down all forms of media. No TV, radio, newspapers, internet, cell phone, texting, or tweeting. Then the 200 students were asked to write about this experience on their personal blogs. While many admitted to being incredibly addicted to media, they wrote the most about hating to be disconnected from their world, their friends and family. They discovered that information is a precious commodity. One student was struck by the fact that suddenly he knew less about everything than everyone else around him, whether that was news, class information, scores, or what happened on Family Guy. Which brings me to the good news. Even in these economic times, we will have jobs because what we do is so essential to every other field. The bad news is that what we would do will be constantly changing and we'll have to keep up. This will be your challenge. Because communication offers so many paths and because the world keeps changing, you're not done making decisions. If you're anything like me, you'll change course more than once. After completing my PhD, I was hired as an assistant professor. It was immediately apparent that the path to tenure and job security meant publishing lots of research articles in academic journals. But I had a dilemma. I wasn't very enthusiastic about my dissertation topic. And I knew that pursuing it would mean writing to impress a handful of other academics. That wasn't my goal in life. Instead, I wanted to solve real problems and help people. I yearned for socially relevant work, and I got the chance in a surprising way. One of my graduate students was interning for Porta Novelli, a social marketing firm. The federal government had asked Porta Novelli to figure out how to test the effectiveness of health messages before they were widely and expensively disseminated. My student managed to get me on an expert panel advising the government about how this could be accomplished. My career in health communication was born. 
My students are always shocked to learn that as a graduate student, I never had a formal course in health communication. There's a simple reason for this. There were no courses. Health communication didn't even exist as a career path until the early 1970s. So what does this story imply for you? It means that you may find yourself applying what you've learned here at Emerson in ways that don't even exist today. Does that idea frighten you? Well, don't let it, because what you do have is a set of skills and an understanding of a process that will serve you well no matter where fate takes you. I have a story to illustrate this point. In the late 1980s, I worked for a consulting firm that was contracted by USAID, the Agency for International Development. Their task was to encourage family planning in Ghana, West Africa, by promoting the use of condoms. The briefing I received in Washington before leaving for Ghana made the task seem straightforward enough. But as I would soon learn, this briefing was only the tip of the iceberg. When I arrived, I learned that the entire condom marketing project was based on the assumption that condoms were completely unavailable in Ghana, and there was a pent-up demand for them. If the U.S. supplied them, people would line up to get them. But no one had ever asked outside the capital city whether this assumption was accurate. I had hardly unpacked when the head of the U.S. mission sent me up country a place so remote I was the first white woman many had ever seen. This turned out to be one of the most memorable experiences of my life and a chance to learn uh, to apply what I learned on childhood hunting trips as well as in communication research courses in grad school. I traveled with a local Ghanaian who arranged for me to be received by regional tribal chiefs and even to join him in paying my respects to the collective widows of a recently deceased village elder. Oh, and we also went crocodile hunting. Now you may be wondering what that's like, and so was I as I set off. The first stop was at a local village to barter for a chicken. I had assumed we would get a full-grown one, but no, we ended up with a few days old chick. I learned later that they make the most enticing noise to a crocodile. Along with the chick came almost the entire village piled into an old decrepit truck for the trip to the crocodile pond. There was a brief, tense moment when the young men of two neighboring villages engaged in conflict resolution to decide who had jurisdiction over this particular crocodile pond. Finally, the hunt began. One brave young man ran around the pond squeezing the check so he would squeal loudly. The objective was to draw the crocodiles to the edge of the pond so someone could climb on and ride the crocodile. At this point, I got nervous. <laughs> this hunt seemed to be in my honor, and I had this sinking feeling that if there was an obliging crocodile, I might be asked to take the ride. Luckily for me, the crocodiles were lazy that day and showed only mild interest in the bait. Even the chicken was spared. But most importantly, I used my research skills and conducted store audits of local chemical sellers who were the rural version of drugstores. I found they had plenty of condoms, but these were expired and of such poor quality that they were worthless for preventing pregnancy or disease. If our program brought in new condoms, we would have to buy the worthless old ones to get them off the shelves. Our health communication campaign could create the demand for condoms, but if chemical sellers met that demand with inferior products, this low-cost, effective, and safe method of protecting health could be rejected by the local people for a long time. 
When I was a graduate student, I never would have believed that the communication theory and research I learned in Iowa and Florida would serve me so well in West Africa, but it did. Many of you may find yourself working in organizations where communication is not well understood or appreciated. You may need to sell yourself and your profession in addition to doing your work. Much later in my career, after 24 years of academic research and teaching, I joined the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, better known as CDC, as the first director of an Office of Communication. Every day there presented a new challenge. Convincing scientists of the need to translate indecipherable text into words the public could actually understand. Persuading program managers to fund interventions that relied on communication. And framing valuable public health issues in ways that would not draw fire from political extremists. These were tough to deal with but nothing compared to the events of late 2001, when a nation traumatized by 9-11 faced its first major bioterrorist attack. As anthrax-laced envelopes were opened and people got sick and a few died, CDC held daily press conferences. Our representatives appeared on all the morning and evening broadcast news programs, and we raced to update websites daily. I learned quickly what it meant to be the major 24-7 news source that the media, the public, policymakers, and the medical community relied on to protect the country against anthrax. It took considerable courage to focus the agency on communication during this critical time. In fact, one of the senior leaders said publicly at the beginning of the crisis, it doesn't matter if CDC fails at communication as long as its science is successful. What she did not understand until much later is that the two are inseparable. CDC, like other organizations tested by a crisis, grew to appreciate that communication is every bit as important as science in a situation like this. Jeffrey Copeland, who was director of CDC during the anthrax attacks, later reflected on his role as a public communicator. He said, during the anthrax crisis, it became obvious that public communication had become in some sense fully as important as, if not even more important, than the line duties of senior decision makers. Let me conclude by saying that I envy you. You're entering the communication uh, profession at such an exciting time. My wish is to send you off with a spirit of adventure and excitement. You've chosen a career where you can make a difference. Whatever cool new technologies emerge, the universal need to connect with others is eternal and will serve you well. Thomas Edison said it best, and I leave you with these words. If we did the things we are capable of, we would astound ourselves. Thank you.